So let me introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Javier Alonso, uh, Alonso Mora. So Javier is an associate professor at the Cognitive Robotics Department of uh, Delft University of Technology, where he leads the autonomous multi-robot laboratory. He is a principal investigator at the Amsterdam Institute for Advanced Metropolitan Solutions and co-founder of the routing company. He is actively involved in the Delft robotics ecosystem, including the Robotics Institute, the Transportation Institute, and the Robo Valley. Uh, Javier's main research interest is in navigation, motion planning, and the control of autonomous mobile robots, with a special emphasis on multi-robot systems, on-demand transportation, and robots that interact with other robots and humans in dynamic, dynamic and uncertain environments. He is the recipient of multiple prizes and grants, including an ERC standing starting grant, the ICRA Best Paper Award on Multi-Robot Systems, an Amazon Research Award, and a Talent Scheme VENI Award from the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. Javier, welcome and thanks for taking the time uh, to uh, talk here, and uh, please take it away. Uh, Javier, can you hear us? I think you're muted. Okay, now you shall be able to hear me, hopefully. Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I, I'm really sorry I cannot be there in person. Uh, but yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation as well. And uh, yeah, so let's see if the slides also work. Uh, so now it shall be full screen. Yes. Okay, so should I get started or? Uh, yeah, you can start. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so uh, again, uh, thanks a lot for the invite. And uh, yeah, I'm really sorry I'm not there, but hopefully we will see each other in the next conference. And uh, yeah, feel free to send me an email after this talk or I, I hopefully we'll have time for questions also at the end. So yeah, so it was said I'm Javier Alonso Mora and an associate professor at TU Delft in the Netherlands. And I will be talking uh, today mostly about multi-robot, uh, so more motion planning among decision-making agents, which I think it's a very important building block for multi-robot systems. Uh, so let's see. So for the talk, I will start with a brief introduction to um, yeah, motion planning and uh, MPC, model predictive control. And then I will mostly focus uh, for today on our work on uh, how to model uncertainty. And uncertainty is very important because uh, these robots will have to, uh, as you saw from the previous speakers, right? Uh, you have the robots that interact in environments shared with other robots, cars, and humans, and there is uncertainty linked to all of this interaction. And then the second challenge that I will uh, talk very briefly about, uh, because it was already very well covered by the previous two speakers, so then I'll, I'll more briefly uh, uh, set a few words about it. Uh, will be the one of interaction with those other agents. So overall, uh, the, the goal where we want to go at is something like this, and I think this is shared with all of you that are attending this workshop. Uh, I foresee a future, and I want to contribute towards a future where uh, hundreds or thousands or millions of uh, mobile robots will coexist with us humans. And this is important because you will need the interaction with other robots, uh, delivery robots, your self-driving cars, uh, cleaning your streets, uh, you name it, but also with humans because the robots will not be alone in our shared world. So we have to interact or the robots will have to interact with both other robots as well as uh, humans. And uh, one example that, uh, so we work uh, in our group in different application areas. One of them is shared mobility on demand with autonomous vehicles. And there, a key question is, how can we control thousands of autonomous vehicles? Think, think of them as uh, this uh, minibus or uh, shuttle van that you see in the pictures. And uh, how do you coordinate them? How do you decide on the task? How do you decide which passenger is this vehicle going to pick? And in which order will it do so? And uh, which uh, route is it going to follow? What you see in the image on the left, uh, yeah. Uh, that is the route of uh, a vehicle in, in red that is uh, picking multiple passengers uh, together to fill in this vehicle and deliver them to their destinations. And this is very important because we need vehicles that we need the uh, efficient mobility and uh, that uh, without too much pollution and so on, right? So that's why it's very important to uh, share and get closer to public transit. 
So for today, I will not uh, cover this topic uh, any further, but this is something that we have been very active in our group in the last uh, few years. You have some references there. And if anyone is interested on, on the task assignment and routing, I'm happy to answer any questions you have about this topic uh, in the Q&A session after the talk. Uh, for today, I'm going to mostly focus about the other problem that is uh, motion planning. So how do these vehicles plan a safe motion in an environment shared with other vehicles and humans? And uh, yeah, you saw some examples already from the previous speakers. So driving on a highway, and I will even argue that driving in, in many US cities, it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's very difficult and very challenging. But if you go to an environment, an urban environment in the Netherlands, like the picture you see on the right, it's a bit more crazy because you have bicycles and pedestrians all over the place and the small, very narrow streets. So, yeah, I think uh, this you all know, right? So we have our autonomous vehicle, other agents, so the vehicle takes some observations, and then it will have some belief update and estimator that gives us some prediction or plans for the other agents. Then those going to the motion planner. In particular, we are going to use trajectory optimization. There are many other ways to do motion planning. You have here two uh, survey papers where uh, many different methods were discussed. The one that I will uh, uh, describe and use throughout this presentation is uh, receiving horizon trajectory optimization. That will compute the inputs for our vehicle, like a steering and acceleration, if it's a car. Uh, model predictive control uh, also, yeah, this is receiving horizon trajectory optimization. Uh, typically, we refer to it as just uh, model predictive control or MPC in short. And what we have is we have a horizon, uh, as used already from uh, Marcus Berger uh, earlier in, in, in the talks today in the workshop. So we will optimize for a, a prediction window. Then we have a cost per time step. Uh, and that will be a function of the state, the XK, and the input UK of the robot and the terminal cost at the end of this trajectory, uh, which is discretized for a certain time horizon n. Then we can add constraints like the vehicle model or collision avoidance constraints. And these are the ones that make the problem a bit more challenging. And then you solve this constraint optimization using numerical optimization, and that will give you the set of inputs, the optimal set of inputs for your robot for the time horizon. You apply the first one, and then you repeat over time, right? And this is a very powerful framework. We have used it for many applications. Uh, you have here one example with uh, our self-driving car in Delft, avoiding a pedestrian. Uh, we also have applied it uh, for uh, quadrotors and mobile manipulators. Uh, for example, a quadrotor uh, flying through a narrow openings. Uh, you can see those examples uh, in our group website. So overall, this is a very powerful framework, right? Uh, and I forgot to mention, there are solvers that can solve it. You just formulate uh, nowadays the cost function, the constraints, you give it to a solver like ACADO, ACADO, or Forces Pro, and they will find a solution, uh, hopefully, in a local minima and if there is a, a feasible solution. But yeah, so, so why trajectory optimization? So MPC is very nice because it allows us to consider uh, multiple objectives. Uh, so you just have to add them up in the cost function. You can have explicit models for the vehicle dynamics and the obstacle prediction models uh, for what other agents will do in the future. And you can have these as constraints and therefore safety is encoded and checked for explicitly. And this is important and nice because we are going to have uh, warranties uh, as long as we find a feasible solution to the problem. And uh, it's a very flexible and powerful framework. As I was saying, we have used it for self-driving cars, mobile manipulators, quadrotors, small robots, and many other people also have all, uh, used MPC. So it's a very popular uh, method. However, it also has a few limitations. So, so far, what I have shown so far was a deterministic formulation. Uh, so the first challenge I will describe uh, today is how do we model uncertainty? How can we include uncertainty uh, in MPC? or in other planners, because the things that I will explain are more general. And uh, then uh, there is also, so far there was no interaction with other agents. So that's not uh, obvious how to incorporate in MPC. So the second challenge that I will briefly discuss will be that of interaction. How do we model the interaction with other decision-making agents? And uh, yeah, this is also a local method. So since it's a local method, uh, it, it has some time horizon and local minima that uh, is prone to those. Sorry. 
And uh, it's also, uh, if you have worked with MPC, you will also see that um, it, the, it, it can be quite complex to hand tune this cost function. So for these uh, last two points, I will not cover them today, uh, but uh, we had uh, two uh, papers in ICRA this year. Uh, one is on auto-tuning of optimization fabrics and auto-tuning could also be used uh, for tuning the cost function of the MPC. And the other one is on uh, having a global guidance, uh, looking at different uh, homology classes to guide the MPC. So for those two uh, last points, um, you can refer to, to our ICRA publications. So for the following, I'll, 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 I'll focus on the other two points, uncertainty and interaction. So here you have one example. This is a car, a human-driven car navigating in Delft. And you, this clearly exemplifies uh, where all these challenges come for urban uh, driving. So the robot or the car needs to understand what uh, other agents are doing, other traffic participants, bikers, pedestrians, delivery vans, other cars uh, in these very narrow environments. And some of them will be following the rules. Others will not, like those people you see there walking in the middle of the street. Uh, you also have bikers that uh, drive crazily in the Netherlands if you have seen them. And this vehicle needs to be able to read those subtle social cues. It needs to implicitly communicate its own actions. And this, depending on the motion that the vehicle does, it will also have an effect on what everyone else does. If our vehicle slows down, the other ones are likely to, to pass in front. If our vehicle keeps moving, probably the others will stop, right? But you don't know. So you need to account for this uncertainty of what will happen in the future. And uh, we, this needs to be safe, right? Our self-driving cars need to move in a safe manner. So uh, the first challenge I wanted to talk about is that of uncertainty. And that can come from both the vehicle itself as well as the environment, because we don't know perfectly what everyone else will do. And here you could rely on models like the ones that were discussed also earlier on. So what changes? So if we take our uh, MPC, our model predictive control problem that so far was deterministic, what we want is to uh, have uh, uh, to say that the probability of collision needs to be below a specified threshold. So what changes in this formulation is uh, we have uh, a cost function that could be the same as before. In this case, we use the, the mean of the, of, of the variables for the cost function, uh, but it could also be done on expectation uh, of the full cost function. And then uh, you also, we also used uh, uh, the, the, the mean uh, for the uh, vehicle dynamics. And the one that uh, we formulated as a probabilistic constraint is this probabilistic avoidance, where we, instead of saying that the state of the vehicle needs to be in free space, what we say now is that the probability of the vehicle being in free space, so to be safe, uh, needs to be greater than one minus epsilon, where this epsilon is the probability threshold. And this is what we call chance-constrained MPC, uh, because this is a constraint that is uh, chance from the uh, probability distribution uh, that you will take uh, random samples in, in when, uh, when planning, when this happens in reality. And this is equivalent to saying that the probability of collision, we want it to be less or equal than epsilon. So this probability threshold. And if this uh, uh, prediction model follows a Gaussian distribution, then this is easy. So we know how to solve it directly. So we can reformulate the chance constraints uh, from this original, this one, to uh, a deterministic function as a function of the mean and the variance of uh, the state of the vehicle and uh, that of other traffic participants or other agents in the environment. And that's what we denote here by x was the state, right? And hat is the mean, and then sigma is the variance of that uh, uh, Gaussian uh, probability distribution. And uh, here we use uh, a result from mathematics that is that the probability of a linear constraint. So uh, here what we will do is we will linearize uh, our non-convex constraint and then say that the probability of this linearized constraint is less or equal than one minus epsilon. That's equivalent to uh, this deterministic function with the error function. And that here the main message is, is that we can go from this probability uh, function, uh, this probability constraint, that the probability of collision needs to be less or equal than epsilon, to a deterministic constraint as a function of the mean and the variance of the variables involved. And um, but we will not always have Gaussian uncertainty, right? So uh, in some cases we will have non-Gaussian uncertainty. 
think for example of the case that you have a pedestrian that you don't know if it will go right or left so now we have two modes in the probability distribution so this is not a gaussian probability distribution anymore so what do we do then so what we have uh, looked at uh, what we have proposed is uh, to use something called a scenario based mpc and the key idea here is that we are going to sample uh, from a probability distribution so we go from our original probabilistic uh, planning problem to a problem where we have a number of samples that we have taken from those probability distributions. Uh, so we start with our original problem, the chance constraint uh, MPC, uh, where we have a probability distribution over the motion of other agents. Uh, here, that will be this uh, human, for example, and that's what we denote by uh, sigma in, in the capital sigma. So that will be a realization of this probability distribution that it's unknown. Uh, then the first thing that we do, as is typical in these problems, is we linearize these uh, collision avoidance constraints uh, with respect to the previous plan. And we do that uh, to make the problem tractable. Otherwise, there is no, no way you can solve this in real time. And then we will sample the scenarios. Uh, and this, uh, this step, the linearization, is a conservative one. So we are basically avoiding a larger space. Now we are then we are sampling as scenarios. So we take uh, samples from that probability distribution. So those points that you see there are uh, different samples that we have taken from that probability distribution. And then we can add the collision avoidance constraints for each of them. So now we have our scenario program uh, where instead of having the probabilistic, so the probability of collision uh, less or equal than epsilon, or the probability of being in the safe uh, space uh, greater or equal than one minus epsilon we now say that we have to basically avoid all the samples that we have taken from that probability distribution. And that's what you see written here in the scenario program, uh, where the capital S is the, uh, the set of samples that we have. Now, this set could be very large. So uh, to warranty, to have probabilistic warranties, you may need hundreds or thousands of samples, uh, which uh, might not be uh, uh, feasible to solve in real time. So the next thing that we do is we prune the scenarios. And this pruning, uh, intuitively what it means is that we look at which ones are the important scenarios. So in, in the example here, the blue ones are a subset that uh, if you avoid those, basically you will be avoiding everything that is behind, right? So that's the intuition of this uh, uh, support uh, uh, subset. So we take a subset of the relevant samples that uh, uh, lead to the equivalent problem as the one that we had with the many samples. And that's the one that we can solve in real time. Now, and uh, if we do this, and here you have one example, uh, well, this one was in simulation, I'll show later one with the real uh, robot. Uh, so here the plan of our robot is the one in blue that is moving along a corridor and the other agents, uh, we are displaying the predictions. So the three dots that you saw for each agent, those are the prediction along the horizon. And uh, here, the nice thing is the well, first of all, this applies to, to arbitrary probability distributions that does not necessarily need to be Gaussian. It can be a sum of Gaussians, for example, or anything else. And we can guarantee that uh, the probability of collision is going to be below epsilon. And this is with uh, a confidence level of one minus beta. And this beta depends on how many samples you take. So the more samples you take, the, the higher your confidence will be. And uh, that's uh, then the, the trade-off between confidence versus uh, computational time in real time. Now, this uh, has this works very well, uh, especially, and as I said, for arbitrary probability distributions, you can use it. Uh, it has some limitations. So the first one is that the chance constraint, as is typical in MPC and in planning, they were defined per time step. Uh, so for every time step and for every uh, obstacle, we will say that the probability of collision is to be less or equal than epsilon. So what uh, you could also think of that we are working on, uh, it's a, we could sample trajectories. And that way we can really say that the probability of collision is less or equal than epsilon for all the obstacles in the environment and for the time horizon. And this can be, so we extended this uh, framework to also be able to sample uh, trajectories instead of states. Now, the other question is, is probability of collision enough? So I will argue that no, probability of collision is not enough. We should actually be considering risk. So this is something that we have not directly done yet uh, in, in, in the, the, the MPC planner. Uh, however, one way that uh, one can do it is by using things like the probabilistic uh, driving risk field. 
uh, where we multiply the, the collision probability by the severity of the crash. Because it's not the same to just severely touch someone or something and stop uh, than if you have a collision at high speed. So we really need to be also thinking about the severity of the collisions uh, to have uh, safer motion planning. And how do we choose epsilon? So how do we choose this probability of collision? So this, honestly, I have I don't know. So I don't know how to choose uh, this epsilon. So the problem is that uh, if you choose a very small epsilon, then uh, you can say your system is very safe, but your vehicle will almost never move uh, because it will be extremely conservative. And if you choose your epsilon uh, very large, then you have the opposite. Your vehicle will be aggressive. It will, will move mostly safely all the time and very well, but uh, you don't have warranties. You might have a collision. So how do you choose epsilon? How do you de do this uh, adapt adaptively? So I think it's very important to think about the risk aware planning and to do this adaptive epsilon uh, to balance the risk. And uh, yeah, we also saw running our experiments that the method was overly conservative. So it worked very well. We had the warranties, but it was conservative. So this graph that you see here, this is a, a typical run of the method uh, with some time steps. And the epsilon that's on the vertical axis, that's the probability of collision. So we had set a bound of 0 0.05. Uh, so that's 5% probability of collision. And you can see that it, it was good. Uh, we warranted that the bound, but our method was very uh, much safer than that. So it was around uh, 0 0.01, uh, maximum 2% uh, probability of collision. So then we started thinking, can we get closer to the bound to have better performance? So to have a narrower gap in, in this uh, uh, collision, probability of collision. So what we uh, presented in ICA uh, this year was that to reduce conservative, what we can do is we can plan uh, multiple trajectories in parallel. And we can do that with different upper bounds. So think of it as we want to have 5% probability of collision. So we will run uh, three plants, for example, one with 5% probability of collision, another one with 10, and another one with, let's say, 20, so higher values. And uh, in, in principle, we only warranty 5, 10, and 20 for each of them. But because we know that they are conservative, then we are going to then run a risk assessment for each of them. So after we, in every time step, after we compute the, these N plans, we, could, we assess the risk of each of them independently. And uh, out of those, we keep uh, uh, the one that is the least conservative one that is uh, still satisfying our uh, abound, so our uh, original, let's say, 5% probability of collision. And that's, that's what the one that we will employ. So this way, we also warranty safety. We also warranty this uh, bound uh, that is going to be less than epsilon. Uh, but to reduce conservativeness, we are doing a posterior risk assessment before we send the trajectory, the inputs to the vehicle in every time step. And uh, this is an example. Uh, you have a simulation on one side, moving a, uh, the, the robot moving a, through a crowd of more people. And on the right, you have it uh, with our own robot uh, avoiding two pedestrians. And uh, in the table, uh, you see that uh, here we are running three uh, planners in parallel one with a 5% probability of collision, another one 10% and another one 20%. And you see that if you were to take directly the 20% plan, you will have uh, much less uh, situations in which a robot has a deadlock and te a temporal freezing. Uh, uh, but uh, that's at the expense of having higher number of collisions. Uh, and if you take the, that's uh, the, the row of the 0.2. And if you take uh, 0.05 epsilon, that's the, the, the bound that we want to have, then you have more uh, situations in which your robot uh, freezes, doesn't know what to do for some time, and it's uh, very safe. So now what we are doing is we are switching between these ones every time step uh, to warranty that uh, we are below the 5% uh, uh, probability of collision, and we see that uh, we can achieve the same level of collision, so close to 0%. Uh, percent, uh, uh, collisions in this experiment were 0%. Uh, the probability bound is 5%, right? So we are still much lower than that. Uh, and uh, we have much less uh, deadlocks than you would have with the original one of 5%. So yeah, doing this uh, risk assessment a posteriori with uh, multiple plans in parallel, it's important to reduce the conservativeness. Uh, so that, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's it for more or less. So that, that's what I wanted to, to explain for, uh, 
for the, uh, the part on uncertainty. So how do we model uncertainty? So we do so uh, with a scenario based MPC by taking samples from the probability distribution. Now, the second challenge that, uh, yeah, I, I very briefly will cover in the interest of time is that of interaction. And here, the key difference is that, uh, well, this is the same figure I showed before for motion planning, right? An, an, an autonomous robot or vehicle. And then in interaction, what happens is that the plan of your robot will have an influence on other agents and what they do. And we need to model this also in both our belief update and our motion planner. And this is then coupled, coupling it because the plan that you plan for the robot will have an influence on what the others do. And you should take that into account in your, uh, in your predictions. And this has been uh, extensively discussed by the previous speakers. Uh, so here I'm, I'm basically just going to be a, give a very brief overview of, of what we have done and what are different uh, ways to, to tackle this problem. And the uh, interaction, uh, as has been said, uh, uh, what happens here is that we want to explicitly account for the actions of other agents. So now instead of optimizing a cost function and a set of constraints that are mostly for our robot, now we have a cost function that depends on both our robot, that's the, the XI, so the state of our robot, and the inputs to our robot use UI. But it also depends on the state and the actions of all other agents in the environment. So those are the ones that you see with the minus I for the state and the input. And we will still have constraints, so vehicle model and collision avoidance constraints. And uh, ideally, you want to solve this uh, joint optimization problem uh, that relates to game theory as has been said before. And uh, there are many philosophies to address this interaction problem. Uh, we have a look at, uh, at uh, several of them. And uh, here the references that you will see are from our own good work, but the, there is uh, much more work also from others, uh, like the one from uh, Mark and Dorsa that uh, uh, went in a uh, great length of detail uh, for modeling interaction in the previous two talks. So the first option is uh, we, have robots that communicate. So if they are all robots that you have designed, that is a system, let's say like the Amazon uh, warehouses, where you have uh, thousands of robots that uh, uh, you control, you could have communication. We could also have vehicle to vehicle communication or vehicle to the infrastructure communication. So if robots communicate, then you can do things like distributed MPC, where they uh, broadcast their trajectories, they coordinate those trajectories to reach uh, safe plans. Uh, but in reality, there will be always agents that don't communicate. For example, humans, bikers, they will not communicate their trajectories explicitly. So we need ways to handle that as well. So the second option is to employ interaction aware uh, motion predictions for other agents. And that basically just means that you still use your MPC, your planner, or whatever planner you like for your robot. But what you are going to do is to use a prediction for the other agents that you have computed in a way that accounts for interaction. So for example, in the paper there, we trained a, a prediction model in a centralized simulation environment to predict what a robot will do in that environment uh, where everyone is doing a, a coordination, cooperation in a centralized manner. And then you can use those predictions in a decentralized manner. The third option, and the, well, the good thing of that is you can use whatever planner you want. You just change the, the prediction. Uh, a function that you are using for other agents. The third option is to imitate what humans do. So we assume that humans are good at coordinating and they are good at interacting with each other. So you will you could collect a lot of data and then uh, train a model, a cost function that uh, uh, tells your robot, your vehicle, how to drive as a human would have done. So that is called imitation learning, for instance. And then the fourth option, that is the one that was described more in detail by the previous two speakers, that is to solve a dynamic game. So you uh, formulate uh, this game theoretical problem and uh, with joint rewards, uh, joint cost function for all the agents that you might also need to estimate. So that's one of the uh, challenges of uh, game theory that uh, you assume uh, the cost function of other agents to be known. So you either design it yourself or you estimate it, and then you solve this uh, joint uh, optimization problem. And you will find that Nash equilibrium, as was discussed by the previous speakers. So yeah, that was done very well by them. So I will not get in de into details of that. That is something we have also done some work on. You have some reference here. And then the fifth one, that is the one I will uh, talk a little bit more uh, in this talk, is to implicitly model the interaction. So let's say you don't want to solve this full game. Um, 
uh, for maybe computational cost, whatever reason. Uh, so what uh, you could also do is to learn a cost function. Uh, and that is what I'm going to explain in the following uh, couple of slides. So what did we do? So this is what we call interactive MPC, a model predictive control. And uh, it came from the, uh, the, the view or the idea that human drivers communicate their intentions and negotiate their driving maneuvers by looking at both the time it takes to, to collide with someone else and the distance to other vehicles. And this could be translated into velocity reference. So that velocity reference is what we will use for guidance for our vehicle. And this uh, relates, for example, to the, the example that you saw before of a self-driving car uh, trying to merge into a lane full of vehicles. And there we want to find a gap. And we want to uh, actually create that gap by interacting with other vehicles. So what we did is we trained uh, a neural network uh, to output a velocity reference for our planner based on current observations. And uh, so here on top in green, you have this uh, DRL agent so that we use uh, deep reinforcement learning uh, where we use um, for the reward, we rewarded the progress. So uh, moving, uh, being able to merge and we penalized uh, when the problem, the, the planner became infeasible we also penalize collisions and distance to other vehicles. And then we can train this uh, in simulation, uh, running many simulations. Uh, then we train this uh, deep reinforcement learning agent. And that one will then output a velocity reference that we can use within our local motion planner. And that one is it's then is going to create a safe maneuver because it has uh, the explicit constraints. And that's the one controlling our vehicle. Now for training uh, this, uh, we need to create uh, scenarios with, uh, with interaction. So what we did was to use the intelligent driver model, in particular a predictive, vers predictive version of the uh, IDM model, so the intelligent driver model. And uh, we had a cooperative coefficient that you could adjust, you could change. So we were sampling different co uh, cooperation coefficients for every uh, driver that could go from being uh, fully egoistic to being uh, uh, yeah, very uh, altruistic uh, or prosocial. And we trained this with uh, soft factor critic optimization. Uh, now, um, yeah, the, here you have some results. So this is our uh, uh, self-driving vehicle, the one in yellow that is trying to merge into a lane full of vehicles. And, uh, depend and then the color and the number of the other vehicles indicate how cooperative they are. So in green and high numbers, they are more cooperative. And in red and low numbers, they are uh, non-cooperative vehicles. So here, the ve our self-driving car is able to recognize uh, by nudging a little bit. So it tries a little bit and then sees what happens. I think that's what uh, probably the policy is learning to do. Uh, it tries to nudge a little bit and it sees what, what is the reaction of the other vehicles. And when it sees that someone is uh, uh, slowing down, I guess, then it merges. We don't know exactly what it's doing, that policy, right? Because it's a trained model. So it's kind of a black box model, uh, but we only use it as a reference velocity so that our planner takes the collision avoidance constraints and is still uh, safe. And we saw that this uh, joint version where we have a learned cost function and then the uh, trajectory optimization problem, uh, it, it outperforms both uh, uh, pure uh, MPC and RL uh, uh, methods. And we have also used this approach for other types of robots. So not only cars, we have also used it for uh, small robots moving ar around the uh, people. So here in blue, it's a, a robot that uh, uh, we have trained a recommender, a position sub goal recommender that tells the robot in which direction to move, uh, for example, to avoid congestion or to avoid areas where there are non-cooperative vehicles, or it tells it you can go through because they are going to be cooperative. And we have also used a similar uh, idea where we train a policy to recommend uh, uh, informative positions for a robot that is exploring the, the, an unknown environment. So yeah, that brings it to, to the end of my talk. So in summary, I discuss uh, the, the problem of motion planning among decision-making agents. And in particular, I mostly focus on uncertainty. So how do we model uncertainty? And if you have uh, uh, Gaussian distributions, then you can directly formulate your chance constraints and uh, have a deterministic uh, 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 constraint that it's a function of the mean and the variance. And if you have non-Gaussian probability distributions, then what you can do is you can sample the scenarios. And that's what is called a scenario MPC. For interaction, there are uh, many different ways to model interaction. 
uh, the, one of them is to formulate the game and solve that game. Another one uh, would be to learn guidance uh, policies. And yeah, that uh, brings me to the end of this talk. So thanks a lot for listening. And if you have any questions, please send me an email uh, or I'm happy to talk to you in the next conference where we can see each other in person. So I'm happy to answer any questions uh, now. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Javier. And, uh...